Welcome to this week's DeFord Lecture. We're very happy to have uh, Amy East visiting us from Santa Cruz, where it is colder and really <laughs> snowing, which is a little bit unusual for that part of the world. Um, and to tell us a little bit about Amy and her research, uh, Matt Mikowski. Okay, thank you everyone for coming to the talk. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Amy East. She's a research geologist at the U.S. Geological Survey in Santa Cruz, uh, which is where I met her when I was doing a, a postdoc there. So Amy's now firmly grounded in the, in the, on the Pacific Coast, but she started on the East Coast. She did her bachelor's at Tufts and then a PhD at, at MIT in Woods Hole, which is where some of you here know her from. Um, so some of you may know her in her uh, editorial role as, a, as an editor-in-chief at JGR Earth Surface. Um, I strongly encourage you to check out the, the paper that she's going to be talking about today, um, which is a review paper looking at the effects of, of climate change, the sedimentological effects of climate change, particularly in the West. Um, and so uh, and, and a, a few other things to mention. She's also a fellow with the, with the uh, Geological Society of America in 2018. And earlier in her career, she was the recipient of the Wilson Award for Excellence in Sedimentary Geology. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Amy East to tell us about uh, what's going on in the West. There we go. Can you hear me on the mic? Yes. OK. okay. Well, good afternoon. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today and to present this work. I'm so excited that we're doing academic visits in person again since COVID. It's really nice to meet you all. So yes, um, I'm a research geologist at the USGS. I've been there almost 20 years somehow, and I've been very fortunate to work on a huge range of interesting problems uh, at the USGS. These include sand transport in drylands, gravel bed river processes, and hill slope, fluvial, and coastal responses to fire and extreme rain. I've even gotten to work on some effects of deglaciation. That might sound like a random assortment of topics, but, and it's true, I've been accused of having an eclectic career. And it's true that the settings I'm showing here, which are all places that have done field work in the last four or five years, are geomorphically pretty unrelated. But what ties them together is that modern climate change is affecting all of them. As the Earth continues to warm, climate change will increasingly impact the geomorphic evolution of all these types of systems and more. So drylands, rivers, steep hill slopes, the coasts, and the cryosphere. I'd like to give an overview today, a sort of 30,000 foot view of the major physical landscape responses to climate change and the challenges to detecting and quantifying those and then offer some thoughts as to how we as a geomorphology community can tackle this huge set of problems. We're now about 50 years into the time when human alteration of Earth's climate has been distinctly evident above natural variability. Greenhouse gas emissions accelerated rapidly in the second half of the 20th century, as is now well known. On the right here, I'm showing plots of carbon dioxide emissions from the IPCC's fifth assessment report, showing that carbon emissions from fossil fuel burning, which is this gray field here, accelerated greatly after the mid-1900s. Consequently, by around 1970, land and ocean surface temperature anomalies became apparent that continue to climb. The plot on the left is from the IPCC's sixth assessment report, showing annually and globally averaged surface temperature anomalies relative to the average from 1850 to 1900. This black line is observed temperature, and the colored fields are model results from CMIP-6, showing how climate would have evolved with only natural drivers and no human influence. That's this bluish green field. And then in the brown field, the warming you get when you add anthropogenic emissions onto natural drivers. Humans have been changing landscapes at regional scales for more than 9,000 years, and influencing climate for a few hundred years. But around 1970 is when this warming signal really became distinct from the noise of natural variability. And the envelopes of uncertainty in these sets of model results doesn't overlap after the late 1990s. In geologic time, the 53 years since 1970 is, of course, very short. Discerning landscape 
responses to climate change is a really hard problem in general over any time scale because largely because other factors influence landscapes too, of course, tectonic activity and human land use. So if we look for modern climate change effects on landscapes with only 50 years of data, even if we're looking in places without tectonic activity and without direct human land use, how well can we really identify responses that are truly attributable to modern climate change? That is absolutely a tough question, but I think that we have to try to go after the answers so that we can better prepare for effects that climate change will have on human health and safety, effects on the built environment, on food, water, and energy security, and the economic consequences of those, as well as to preserve ecosystems as well as we can. So what types of res responses do we mean? Uh, the diagram I'm showing here so shows some of the known or anticipated landscape effects of climate change. From the starting point of global warming, some geomorphic responses follow directly, including permafrost thaw and thermal rock stresses and fractures. Other landscape responses are secondary because they're following from hydrologic effects, which include a, shift, a change in precipitation from snow toward rain, melting of glacial ice and perennial snowpack, as well as a shift in timing of snowmelt to be earlier in the year. In a warmer climate, we expect more extreme rain because warmer air holds more water vapor. And extreme dry years are also more likely, as is long-term drought driven by warm temperatures. Global warming raises the probability that a dry year will also be warm, and so the likelihood of co-occurring warm and dry conditions leads to greater drought risk overall. For some areas, climate models are predicting that more rapid swings will occur between extreme dry and extreme wet conditions, which is basically what we're seeing in California, where I live right now. Um, California's wet season is becoming concentrated into less time during the year, so we're seeing the wet season start about four weeks later than it did in the 1960s. Warming and these hydrologic changes will affect vegetation in complex ways, one result of which is that you have a greater risk of large and intense fires. So from these hydroclimatic changes, um, we expect and see coastal effects of sea level rise. We see permafrost thawing. We can expect more landslides, rock falls, and debris flows, more mass wasting. Um, we can reasonably expect more sediment transport and watershed sediment export, since we're increasing both the supply of sediment from mass wasting and post-fire erosion, and also increasing fluvial transport capacity, at least at some times during storms. So we should eventually see changes to river morphology over time as a result. In arid and semi-arid regions, a warmer, drier climate um, dries out the soils and lowers water tables, which makes it harder for plants to survive. And as vegetation cover decreases in areas where there already isn't a lot of vegetation cover, um, loose, sandy soils can be reworked by wind into migrating dunes and also produce more airborne dust. For simplicity, I've left some things off this diagram. For example, we also expect more glacial lake outburst floods. And you could also draw feedback arrows that I haven't put on here. For example, the more fires emit black carbon and the more airborne dust is mobilized from dry lands. Um, when you have more black carbon and more airborne dust landing on snowpack, it actually accelerates the melting of the snowpack also because of decreased albedo. So if you wanted to put all the possible feedbacks on here, you'd almost have to draw this diagram in 3D. We can then add a lower layer onto this schematic to focus on adverse effects. So now in these boxes at the base of our diagram, I'm, list I'm listing some of the associated risks to life, health, and property that follow from these geomorphic changes. This is not an exhaustive list, but uh, the list includes coastal property loss and damage, aquifer effects um, from permafrost thaw. Northern latitudes and high altitude regions have problems from mass wasting in various forms. That could be alpine rock falls. And uh, you may also have seen these dramatic pictures of thermokarst slumps and other ground deformation in high latitude regions where permafrost is thawing. I also mentioned here that in some areas, the thaw of permafrost is compromising indigenous people's food storage methods where people would have food storage lockers underground. Landslides, rock falls, uh, and debris flows obviously put lives, property, and infrastructure at risk. In this box here, I also mentioned tsunamis because as glaciers retreat and leave valley walls 
uh, deep buttress without the glacier ice to support them. Um, mass wasting often occurs along those valley walls. And where that happens with tidewater glaciers, if the mass wasting occurs into water, it can generate a tsunami. More hill slope erosion uh, can cause riverbed aggradation and so increase the flood risk depending on how the river's transport capacity and supply balance out. More post-fire erosion um, can have adverse effects to water quality and also can reduce storage space in reservoirs. Um, my research group does a lot of work on this with reservoirs in California. Finally, increased wind-blown dust, either after fires or just normal aeolian dust entrainment from drylands, um, can cause higher rates of traffic accidents and respiratory disease. This is actually one of the largest economic impacts of climate change predicted in the U.S. And in some areas, it can also cause increased um, sand dune migration, which impedes roads and can damage buildings. That might sound like a sort of obscure landscape effect, but in some parts of the Southwest, migrating dunes become a constant problem affecting road use. So these are the landscape changes we can expect. Some are happening clearly already. Others can be subtle and have drivers other than climate too. So in order to manage these risks, how do we identify where these landscape processes are changing and how rapidly and how big a role climate plays in them. When you're investigating how climate could be changing a geomorphic system, you really want to know what that system was like for decades before 1970 and then for decades since then during the modern warming era. An obvious challenge then is that time series data are often just too sparse to tell you what you want to know. If you want to know whether sediment flux from a given watershed is increasing, for instance, it's pretty rare that anyone has been measuring long enough with consistent methods and sampling protocol to answer that. So here's a typical situation. Let's say you look up a stream gauge record, and the example here is from the watershed that I live in and that I've been studying for a dozen years. So you look up the stream gauge record at the USGS website, and you find that it has decades of really useful stream flow data, you get all excited realizing this stream gauge has been measuring discharge since 1936. And you get all excited then noticing there's a record of sediment concentration. You think, oh, hooray, USGS. And that sounds really promising. And then you click on it <laughs> and you find they only measured sediment from 1972 to 1982. There's almost 90 years of stream flow data, but only 10 years of sediment data. And you can't trust a sediment rating curve to be stationary since 1982. So you can't tell anything about long-term geomorphic change in that watershed using these data, whether it's from climate or from any other cause. So if you want to know what this watershed is doing in recent decades and going forward, you're going to have to start measuring yourself, which is what we do now with this watershed, actually. This is a nationwide issue in the US. There was a lot more fluvial sediment data collection in the 1970s and early 80s than at any time since then. This is a plot uh, from Warwick and Milliman, 2018, showing that the number of sediment samples collected in coastal watersheds has declined so much since the 1980s because of budget cuts to national programs that today we cannot easily quantify changes in sediment flux in recent decades. For places that do have long records, and there are still some, often the methods of sampling have changed. So instead of measuring every every day, which the USGS tended to do in earlier decades, the USGS might now sample only during high flows, so the records aren't directly comparable. So when we want to quantify rates, patterns, and nuances of process to know how climate could be changing watersheds, we often just don't have the right time series data. And this is just for suspended load. You want bed load? Almost nobody measures bed load. So this one might sound discouraging. However, for some geomorphic processes, at least, we don't need high-resolution time series. You can tell, for instance, that a glacier is shrinking and get a pretty decent idea of the rates, even when the measurements are photos taken years or decades apart. Here's an example. Um, this is from the work of Huss et al. 2021. They're working on a glacier in the Swiss Alps. They have more than 100 years of data looking at the glacier's evolution. And among their data are seven what they're calling DEMs, between 1936 and 2019. They had digitized the older ones from old topographic maps and imagery, and they had some direct measurements of ice position from some intervening years. So their, their high resolution data have low temporal resolution, sometimes more than a decade apart, and they have really high spatial uncertainty. 
but that's fine. For this type of process study, the magnitude of changes are still large enough to be interpreted robustly, even with low frequency and mostly low resolution data. So the whole issue of time series availability will hinder some process studies more than others. Then, of course, for many landscape processes in many regions, it's really difficult to disentangle effects of climate and human land use. Many land uses cause the same types of geomorphic change that we expect to see because of warming climate, such as destabilizing slopes or increasing sediment production. One example is in studies of windblown dust in the western US. Multiple studies have found an increase in airborne dust across the western US um, in the last 30 years. Um, this is consistent with the 20 year mega drought going on in the southwest since 2000. In the picture, the image I'm showing on the lower right is um, trends in March dust concentrations measured from 1995 to 2014 with the warmer colors meaning larger increases. So in a warmer climate, dryland plant cover decreases, and so the wind and trains sand and dust more easily, and dust fluxes are higher during more severe drought years. It might look like this if you're driving across northern Arizona um, in a dusty spring. But there's also land use that has the same effect. It's not just about drought. There's livestock grazing, off-road vehicle use, and oil and gas extraction activities that all are decreasing plant cover too, which makes it easier for dust to be entrained by wind. Some authors favor land use as the dominant explanation for these multi-decadal dust increases, and other authors favor climate. Among those, there's debate about how much global warming matters versus climate cycles like El Nino. So there's a lot still to be learned about these questions. Then there's tectonics. High altitude, steep mountain areas have shown some clear climate responses already, including rock falls and landslides as mountain permafrost thaws and glaciers retreat. And high altitude cryosphere is thought of as one of the easiest places to detect modern warming effects. But high steep mountain terrain got that way because of tectonic activity. And a lot of those areas are still tectonically active. So uh, the Andes, Southeast Alaska, high mountain Asia, New Zealand, those places all have major earthquakes from time to time, which will cause landslides, which will increase the sediment production. And so that really complicates trying to measure impacts of climate change there. Over small spatial scales, that is especially difficult because of lag times in climate or tectonic forcing and the slope response. So if the slopes that are already getting ready to fail have recently failed due to either a big storm or an earthquake, it will be some time before that landscape can respond like that again, even when there is another major driver, like another big storm. Hysteresis and lag times in geomorphic systems make detecting climate change even more difficult. Not only does human activity shape landscapes, but the data availability is heavily biased toward times and places with human land use. Fluvial sediment records are a prime example. So most long-term sampling programs are not in pristine, undeveloped watersheds. They're almost always in places disturbed by logging, deforestation with its associated dirt road use, uh, or mining activities that motivated the sampling effort in the first place. In the western US, where I mostly work, the best monitored rivers are those that have had a lot of logging in the watersheds, and so the logging companies were required to go and measure turbidity and suspended sediment. It doesn't have to be about anthropogenic disturbances either. One of the most comprehensive sediment load records in this country is the 40 plus years of data on the Toodle River, Washington. Why? Because Mount St. Helens is at the top of the watershed, and so a lot of effort and money went into monitoring effects of the 1980 eruption. So for various reasons, data often exist because the data collectors were interested in landscape disturbances, which were large enough to then limit the utility of those data for detecting climate signals today. Records of other landscape processes are subject to human reporting bias. If you want to know whether landslides occur more frequently in recent years than pre-1970, which we'd expect in a warmer climate with more extreme rain, you really need good landslide inventories. Until very recently, landslide inventories were compiled from records of people reporting damage. That includes news media or public records of damage to buildings and roads. Those inventories are, of course, useful for risk assessment, but they don't tell you the whole picture because they're not telling you what landslides happen in undeveloped areas. Um, this is an example right here. So 
there was a fairly impressive shallow landslide event in uh, Tuolumne County, California in March 2018. An extreme storm caused more than 500 landslides. Fortunately, they didn't damage any buildings or roads. This happened in an unpopulated area. So almost nobody knew about it. And it was never reported anywhere. So geoscientists only became aware of this major landslide event by sheer luck about four months after it happened. Also, disaster reporting can be limited if the affected communities just don't have the means to report, which sometimes happens with impoverished or otherwise marginalized communities of people. The prevalence of this type of bias is fortunately starting to change because machine learning algorithms are now being developed that can detect and map landslides from remote sensing data over large regions. So future inventories can and should include unpopulated areas and the effects of changing climate might then be teased out of the data. Because remote sensing data quality is ever improving, it's also easier to see geomorphic detail in new higher resolution imagery. So, we have to ask whether the landscape was changing or whether we just couldn't see it that well in the older, worse quality images. To compare modern conditions with older decades is especially difficult if you're trying to look before 1984 when Landsat data became widely available. Brendan Murphy et al. wrote an interesting paper about this um, in a paper on fire history and how we see fire history. And their paper's title is, begins with beyond the 1984 effect. And that concern applies to other geomorphic processes too. Adding to those challenges, geomorphic systems are just inherently noisy. Even when we have lots of data, landscape processes involve inherent randomness. They are noisy, and I'm sure we've all lost some sleep over this, and they have nonlinear relations between driver and response, sometimes with even unpredictable directions of landscape response. Autogenic geomorphic noise makes it hard to detect long-term climatic signals that might be subtle. One source of noise is individual extreme events whose disturbance effects just last a long time. Northern California rivers had very large floods in 1955 and again in 1964 that changed those rivers for decades. The signal of the 1964 floods was still evident in sediment rating curves in Northern California rivers up to 25 years later. Um, with, this is Andy Gray's work, which makes it really hard to tell whether or when global warming's hydrologic shifts started affecting those watersheds too. So are they responding to climate or weather? And if so, is that still the weather they got in December 1964? As another example, Smith and Wegman looked at landslide patterns on an unpopulated area of the Olympic Peninsula, Washington. Um, they had a record um, from aerial photography from 1990 to 2015, and they identified spatial patterns in where landslides were happening, and they tied them to precipitation. So I contacted Steve Smith, and I asked if there was any temporal trend in their data. And he said, we really can't say, because almost all the landslides in that 25-year record happened from just two storms, one in 2006 and one in 2007. Those storms were made more likely by a warming climate but they and the landslides could just be noise in a stochastic system that just leaves a long imprint on the landscape. And then in California, we have another example here. The Santa Clara River had a 500-year flood in 2005. This event brought uh, 5 million cubic meters of sand into the near shore zone, and it grew this river mouth delta by about 200 meters out into the ocean. Uh, longshore currents carried the sand down to the south, where this wave of beach accretion was evident for the next 15 years. People understandably get concerned about beach loss and coastal retreat in Southern California as sea level rises. So how do beaches respond to climate change? Well, these beaches mostly just cared about that one flood for the next 15 years. Detecting longer term responses to sea level rise is made more difficult by the fact that this individual extreme event just has a long imprint. As climate affects the headwaters of a basin, whether you see that signal downstream also depends on connectivity within the sediment transport system. For example, alpine areas that are undergoing deglaciation can produce temporary spikes in sediment yield for years to decades as new sediment supply becomes available from outwashed plains in front of the glacier and as slopes can fail along newly exposed valley walls. But whether you see that sediment downstream and whether it might start causing problems, such as from bed aggradation, increasing the flood stage, 
really depends on how well those new sediment sources are connected to the drainage network. In the Ho River, Washington, um, glaciers have retreated rapidly in the headwaters uh, in the last few decades, exposing new gravel and sand deposits in front of glaciers. Here's one example. This is the, the Ho Glacier retreating between 1990 and 2017, and it's leaving these big outwash plains of sand and gravel exposed in front of the glacier. There is high connectivity in this watershed. And so 30 kilometers downstream of where this, uh, these images are from, you see the signal of this new bed load supply in the morphology of the Ho River. The channel of the Ho River has gotten a lot wider and more braided in recent decades, consistent with having new bed load supply, um, probably from these new uh, deposits exposed in front of the glacier. But if that bed load had been trapped in a proglacial lake or stored long-term in floodplains, or if the river just hadn't had enough transport capacity to move the sediment very far, it might take tens or hundreds of years before you can tell that that's happening downstream. So those are some of the challenges in detecting landscape responses to modern climate change. But I think we do have opportunities, though, to learn a lot. First, we will benefit from collecting data in many more places with an eye to whether recent climate effects are detectable. Stephen Jay Gould wrote an essay in the 90s called Dinosaur in a Haystack, which I really, really liked. And it's about how paleontologists were trying to understand whether extinctions in the fossil record happened gradually or abruptly. Answering that came down to collecting a lot more data from a lot more places at a painstaking level of detail, trying to take the haystack apart piece by piece. In our case, doing so would include mining historical and paleo data, studying places that should have a high signal to noise ratio, and especially places with little or no human land use, and making sure we publish relevant findings, whether they're showing climate change responses or not. One way to learn about long-term watershed changes is to make more use of lake records. I mentioned earlier that in-stream sediment flux measurements often don't continue long enough or in the right places to tell us about multi-decadal climate effects, but lake records could if we're using lakes with high enough deposition rates to see detail in the last 50 years and then be able to compare that to earlier time intervals. There is one intriguing record uh, published on cores from Lake Quinault, Washington, where the authors, Smith et al., inferred from grain size data in their cores that more large floods had occurred in the last 50 years than in any other time interval of the last 4,000 years. So the plot on the right is showing a um, number of extreme events, which they're inferring from grain size data, and they're assuming represent large floods. And they see more of those in the last 50 years than in any other time in their carbon dated 4,000 year record. This could indicate responses to changing hydrologic regime in the last 50 years. We do know that the Quinault River that feeds this lake has had an enhanced flood regime over those same decades. So it's an interesting result, and it warrants further study. It's not clear yet whether this is a regional pattern. If we could examine stratigraphy in more lake cores, we could potentially learn a lot about recent watershed evolution that we are not likely to learn from in-stream sediment flux data. We could learn a lot from paleo records, even when they're not that paleo. Um, this includes data mining historical imagery for purposes like evaluating landslide history, or inferring dry land responses to climate change in areas with little or no human land use, if we can reasonably get past the, the problem of mapping bias due to changing image resolution. For example, um, Marin et al. published a neat study in 2005 showing how rates of sand dune migration increased during drought. They did this work in Great Sand Dunes National Park, Colorado, where there hasn't been a lot of human or livestock land use. They compared dune positions in imagery going back to the 1930s against the Palmer Drought Severity Index, and they saw a connection. So there's more dune migration, uh, more, more dune movement when the PDSI is lower, so when drought conditions are worse. There are a couple studies like this, but large areas of the Southwest haven't been studied in this way. And um, I think the results would matter to people living in drylands of the Southwest, um, particularly tribal communities who are often living on some of the driest, most marginal land and who are therefore dealing the most with public health issues from airborne dust, as well as infrastructure problems from migrating dunes. So I think this type of study, expanding this type of work could be really fruitful. New methods based on machine learning are starting to be used to detect geomorphic changes like this over larger regions too. And so effects of climate change 
undoubtedly will be investigated more in future data sets with AI techniques. Traditional or indigenous place-based knowledge is an important paleo record also. Indigenous communities often have strong ties to place that go back many generations, uh, accumulating environmental knowledge that's much more extensive than the direct instrument record. So given the right connections in a tribal community and careful handling of information, this can be enormously valuable. As an example, my colleague Margaret Redsteer uh, led a study in which they interviewed 42 Navajo elders individually and then also conducted three group interviews working with an interpreter and asked people about environmental history of the Navajo lands, which includes a very large area about the size of West Virginia in the Southwest. The study also looked into Navajo land claims records that included tribal elder testimonies going back to 1937. The elders' observations included drying of springs and lakes, shifting to drier conditions after the late 1960s, decline in some types of plants abundance, and more frequent dust storms in recent years. So where should we go and look? That depends on what landscape process you're interested in, but we should see the most climate change response in places especially sensitive to thermal and hydrologic changes that are already clear. So, for instance, high latitude terrain where permafrost is thawing and steep high altitude landscapes where um, the cryosphere is warming and where hydrology is already shifting from snow toward rain. High altitude regions produce high sediment yields, which is useful because it increases the chance of your signal being above your detection limit. And they're vulnerable to cascading effects of climate change, um, from slope instability, from flooding and increased sediment fluxes, uh, which all suggest it should be easier to detect and quantify patterns of change. And of course, we want to focus as much as possible on places with little to no human land use. To that end, it would be helpful to catalog places that are likely to respond earliest to climate change and encourage research focusing on those localities for different geomorphic processes. A recent paper by Jeff Coe did this for landslides. He identified what he calls bellwether sites, um, bellwether meaning an indicator site or one that's taking the lead, places to focus on to better understand slope stability responses to climate change. Jeff Coe reviewed literature and historical landslide activity and imagery um, to choose sites where long-term systematic observations would be most informative. Um, he was going for geographic diversity, places with mountain cryosphere and evidence for landslides in the last 10 years, and also places with existing long-term monitoring data to build on. <clears throat> so in his paper, he goes through this, all these criteria, narrows down his list to five places, um, and advocates studying those um, most intensively by remote sensing and direct instrumentation. I think this approach is really useful. I think it would be really productive for our community to assemble bellwether site lists for other climate sensitive geomorphic processes so that we can focus research efforts most productively. Just as important as knowing when climate change is affecting a landscape is knowing when it's not. If you have a data set with sufficient resolution to identify recent climate change effects but find that there were none, it's really important to publish that result. That is how we'll really learn the extent and pace of climate impacts. I realized that my last two slides just said, go study exciting places where change is likely. But that bias toward the exciting has to be balanced by reporting those sites' proportional relevance amid other places that may not be changing, because we want to avoid hyperbolic interpretations. There's a postdoc working in our USGS office. Um, his name is Drake Singleton. And Drake has been collecting cores from fjords in southern Alaska. He has these great high resolution records of sediment fluxes from glaciated and deglaciating watersheds. So I asked him if he can see um, evidence in his cores of changing accumulation rates in recent decades as the glaciers have been retreating and there's other warming effects. And he said no. The overwhelming signal affecting the depositional record in this part of Alaska is from the 1964 earthquake. Um, it there was so much shaking, the whole region shook in 1964 in a 9.2 earthquake, um, and then shook again with a 7.1 earthquake in 2018, and those earthquakes are now dominating the sedimentary record of southern Alaska in recent decades. Any recent climate signal, and there should be some, is just so down in the noise it's not even detectable in his cores. So 
great, publish that result, even if it's just a paragraph in a paper about the earthquakes. That is still a really useful data point for people interested in climate, just to know when other factors matter more. It is really important to acknowledge the context and limitations of our data. My colleague Ann Gibbs, who works on coastal change in the Arctic, likes to point out that although coastal retreat rates in the Arctic are a really um, important and hot topic um, as far as their connection to climate change, and I'll show a slide on that in a minute, the Arctic shoreline is vast and coastal retreat rates have only been calculated in detail for a tiny proportion of the enormous length of the Arctic coastline. Moreover, how would we attribute geomorphic change to modern climate change. For some landscape processes, I think that is just not easy to do robustly or quantitatively, and it requires talking in terms of likelihood and confidence qualitatively instead, which is often done in the National Climate Assessment and in, in IPCC reports too. We have to be as rigorous as possible about communicating uncertainty, but some landscape changes can be confidently linked to recent climate change, mostly things that result from a warming cryosphere. That includes changes to permafrost, including thermokarst development or rates of permafrost coastline retreat. Another example was um, the case of a stream capture in the Yukon that occurred about six years ago because a retreating glacier had exposed a drainage divide. The glacier retreats up valley and there's a drainage divide exposed so the meltwater starts going down to a completely different basin um, and different ocean than before the glacier retreated that far. There's an interesting paper by Sugar et al. that found that that whole set of events had a 0.5% chance of happening under stationary climate, so without anthropogenic climate change. We are also starting to see more types of change attributed quantitatively, such as the percent of burned area in the western US that can be attributed to anthropogenic warming. The answer is about half. Um, this figure is from the fourth national climate assessment, summarizing Abatsuglu and Williams' work. And they found from an analysis of fire weather index that the burned area in the western US recently is about double what it would have been without um, recent climate change. Another quantitatively attributed property has been the decline in soil moisture during ongoing drought in the southwest. About 19% of the decline um, in moisture in the last two decades in soils of the southwest um, has been attributed to human-caused warming by Williams et al. 2022. I want to show a few more examples of published studies to illustrate the types of geomorphic change and the types of data that have been used to show recent climate-driven geomorphic change robustly. One of those is a paper um, that I really liked describing how a storm in 2006 caused debris flows and flooding on the slopes of Mount Rainier, Washington. These debris flows caused $36 million in damage. It was a, it was a really big storm. And there's a really interesting geomorphology paper by Legg et al. about this event. They linked those debris flows to climate change because the debris flows initiated as intense rain fell on steep high altitude slopes that had only just been exposed by rapid deglaciation. So this is a map of Mount Rainier showing in the blue shading where the glacier positions were as of 2008, which is approximately where they were during the 2006 storm. And then in the zoomed in maps, they have these red margins you can see um, which, that show where the glacier extent was in 1970. These red and black crosses in various locations are showing where debris flows initiated during this extreme storm in November 2006. Most of them initiated at locations that are between where the glaciers were in 1970 and where they were at the time of the storm. So they were initiating in these really high steep parts of Mount Rainier that had just become deglaciated. So the recent loss of glaciers was the key factor in debris flows happening where they did because without that rapid glacier retreat, those slopes wouldn't have been exposed to extreme rain. Here's an example of attribution from Southeast Alaska. I mentioned briefly earlier that as a glacier retreats, it's common to see slope failures along valley walls that are no longer buttressed and supported by ice. In the case of tidewater glaciers um, or glaciers that fall directly in, into lakes, those landslides can generate tsunamis. In 2015, this happened in a big way in Tan Fjord, southeast Alaska, where uh, the Tyndall Glacier had retreated about um, 12 kilometers up valley in the last, since the 1960s. Um, and that caused a base level fall of more than 400 meters along this valley and its tributary valleys. There's been a bunch of geomorphic reorganization in that valley as the glacier has been retreating. 
but the biggest uh, single event was this massive landslide that let go in August of 2015. Um, it was 180 million tons of rock fell into the fjord, causing a tsunami that had a 193 meter run up. This is the tsunami run up zone over here that they're showing. This happened because the glacier had retreated rapidly, and the landslide and tsunami were, as Higman et al. put it, a hazard occasioned by climate change. There are a number of places where this could happen in Alaska, the most concerning of which is a creeping landslide called the Berry Arm Landslide near Whittier, Alaska. It's in front of where the Berry Glacier has thinned and retreated up valley pretty rapidly since 2000. As the glacier retreats, the landslide motion increases. Um, this plot on the left here is the relative position of the front of the glacier, and the plot on the right is the relative horizontal motion of the Berry Arm Landslide. You can see that since about 2005, they've been tracking pretty closely together. If that landslide fails catastrophically, as opposed to creeping along, which it's been doing, um, the resulting tsunami could be a life-threatening event for people in Whittier. So it is closely monitored. This landslide has its own website. You can go and look it up and check what the recent motion is like on the Barry Arm landslide. Landslides immediately in front of retreating glaciers are also reported in studies from Switzerland and Greenland. In some cases, thermal effects alone can explain observed increase in high altitude mass failures. Um, Co et al. 2018 showed a time series of rock falls in Glacier Bay National Park from the 1940s to 2016, and they find clusters of rock falls occurring during record warm conditions. They see increased magnitude, mobility, and frequency of these rock fall mass wasting events, and they tied them to um, climate change degrading mountain permafrost and increasing prevalence of rainfall rather than snow. Um, similar situations are reported from Italy and Switzerland, where Sarasavi and colleagues find um, a 300 meter increase in the elevation at which rockfall detachments are happening recently, um, which is controlled by changes in frost cracking and permafrost thaw. I mentioned earlier about coastal retreat rates in the Arctic. I just want to show some examples. Um, rates of coastal bluff retreat in Barter Island, Arctic Alaska, have uh, apparently tripled in recent decades, which has also been attributed to warming effects of decreasing the stability of the permafrost itself. Um, and they can also cause these spectacular mass wasting events from retrogressive thaw slumps that contribute a lot of sediment to the coastal ocean. But in addition to thermal effects, um, the major mechanism, a major mechanism driving the bluff retreat in Arctic Alaska is the loss of sea ice. So in a warmer ocean, sea ice is absent for longer periods of time in summer, meaning that waves can then directly impact the coast and that accelerates the bluff retreat. Lastly, I would like to point to a group of papers recently published by Dong Feng Li and colleagues about sediment flux in streams from high mountain Asia. This really interesting body of work identified a multi-decadal increase in sediment flux from 28 high altitude watersheds in high mountain Asia. Um, they have a 2021 science paper that was building on earlier results showing that stream water flux had also increased as climate warms. In that paper, which is 2020 GRL, Lee et al. modeled relative contributions of temperature and precipitation change, and they concluded that warmer temperature is dominating the increased fluxes, although precipitation is also an important cause, um, including higher ratios of rain to snow and their consequent erosive potential. Then in a 2022 paper, Lee et al. discussed implications for hydropower and energy security as these fluxes of sediment increase specifically how turbines in hydropower dams can be damaged by abrasion as the turbidity increases, and dam stability itself is also at risk from increasingly likely hazards such as glacial lake outburst floods. Increases in stream turbidity have also been seen in the Andes, which authors Ivan Vergara et al. attributed to deglaciation effects there. To wrap up, We've looked at challenges to understanding effects of modern climate change on landscapes, including short, incomplete data records, complications of land use and tectonic activity masking climate signals, multiple types of biases and data availability, and signal-to-noise ratios that include long-lived effects of individual extreme weather events. We also have complications from lag times and hysteresis in geomorphic systems and climate signals attenuating in a watershed if connectivity is low. I consider our main opportunities to be collecting more data, focusing on paleo studies where the chance of getting a good signal to noise ratio would be high, 
focusing research attention on places that are most likely to show change, and coming up with bellwether site lists for different types of geomorphic processes. But also making sure we understand data from those places in the appropriate context and valuing null results, not just results that show major change. So these are undoubtedly complex problems, and there is a lot that we don't know. I wrote a paper in 2020 that was trying to synthesize what we know about climate change effects just on the Western US. Um, the paper eventually came out in reviews of geophysics, and it went to reviewers three times. And this one reviewer kept saying, why are you even writing this paper? This is an intractable problem. Reject. And I can definitely see that perspective, but we still have to try to understand what climate is doing to landscapes and how rapidly. And I think that the state of Earth's surface process science and technology are such that we can make useful progress, even on a very difficult and complex problem. Doing so will mean we're better prepared to manage the effects on human health and safety, infrastructure, food, water, and energy security, economics, and ecosystems that are all influenced by physical landscape change. Um, if anyone would like more information about these topics, I have a huge amount of literature I'd be happy to share. I mentioned a few summary papers here, but I have many more that I would be happy to share or discuss if your research interests intersect with these topics. So thank you for listening.